Hey, what's going on everyone? Greg here. And one thing that we have talked a lot about is the hardware devices surrounding Apple's new M2 Max. And while that's the area where I'm probably the most excited to see how these devices look and what sort of features they will have, we also may be in for less exciting news in the meantime, with rumors that Apple may launch a new M2 MacBook Pro with no design changes and really no new features, which means that what actually might end up being the biggest change for these Macs, at least in the immediate future, is actually what's on the inside, and that is the M2 chip. And while I've talked a lot about M2 Macs in the past, what I really haven't done yet is a dedicated deep dive into what the M2 chip will actually bring and what sort of advantages that chip will have over the M1 chip and even advantages over Apple's more expensive Mac computers outfitted with the M1 Pro and M1 Max chip. And it's likely that if this rumored M2 MacBook Pro really is coming soon, then it may end up being a better choice for you even over the redesigned MacBook Pro. So let's start off with the simple things. What are the actual rumored specs for the M2 chip? Well, we actually have quite a bit of good information on that subject if we are to believe previous reports from Mark Gurman about the actual details of the M2, and I do considering that Mark Gurman reported right down to the exact number of CPU and GPU cores that the M1 Pro and M1 Max chips were capable of. And in that same report, he already gave us a sneak peek on what to expect for M2. So in this Bloomberg report, Gurman details that Apple will be sticking with the same exact core counts as the existing M1 chip. So that's four high performance cores and four energy efficient cores. Now, while that might not sound too exciting at first, the secret power of the M2 isn't the sheer amount of cores like we got on Apple's latest M1 Pro chips, but it's the power behind each individual core. And hey, we already have a good idea on how these cores will actually perform because Apple technically already showed us what manufacturing process they will be building these M2 chips off of because like how the M1 was basically a supersized A14 chip, the M2 will follow that same design logic, but this time be based on the existing A15 chip, which is in our iPhone 13s already. And if we follow the same estimates for performance improvements, it's safe to assume we can estimate around an 11% jump in overall performance. Now again, unlike the M1 Pro and Max, which just have more M1 cores that aren't actually any stronger or faster than the existing M1 chip, the M2 will actually have faster or stronger processing cores. Using that 11% estimate, you can see that single core performance for a theoretical M2 chip will net you around a 1830 single core score in a Geekbench benchmark. And yes, you didn't mishear that. That's faster than the M1 Pro and M1 Max chips because each of those four high performance cores will be running at faster or higher clock speeds that will give these M2 Max even faster single core performance than Apple's more expensive and pro labeled computers. Now what that means for you and for real world usage, that actually means that for the user base that this computer is targeting, some tasks might actually be faster than the M1 Pro and M1 Max chip, especially for the more basic tasks you do on your computer that rely more on single core performance over multi-core performance. So for example, opening an app, which usually just targets you know, a single core, just a few cores, could be faster on these M2 machines, while exporting video files, which utilize all the CPU cores, would probably still be faster on chips like the M1 Pro. However, that's not to say we won't see a boost in multi-core performance on these M2 machines over the existing M1 Max, because each of these cores is individually strong Stronger. And when you add up all of those four cores, it's likely that the multi-core performance will be much stronger. And honestly, I think it could just about rival the entry-level six-core M1 Pro chip with its multi-core performance. Because using that same metric, we could see those multi-core scores approaching just shy of 9,000 for a Geekbench benchmark, putting it just below the six high performance core M1 Pro machine. Another area where you can pretty much predict that trajectory is in the GPU area, because we saw that GPU cores increased on the A15 chip this year, 
with the iPhone 13 Pro and Pro Max receiving a new 5-core GPU. This means that one area where core counts may be changing is in that GPU department. In fact, we have seen Apple go absolutely crazy with the amount of GPU cores it threw into the M1 Max, which max out at a whopping 64 total cores. And Apple is rumored to be making even bigger GPU core counts with an even beefier version of an M1 Max Duo chip, which could feature as many as 64 GPU cores and an M1 Max Quad chip with a staggering 128 of those GPU cores. Of course, an M2 chip like the existing M1 will probably have bin chips. So, uh, you know, German was basically saying that maybe if Apple wasn't able to achieve a full 10 core design on all of the M2 chips, some of them would come with nine GPU cores, probably for something like a future entry-level MacBook Air model. This thing will be a screamer, but best of all, it will have unique benefits that go just beyond power, and that is power efficiency. If there's one thing I loved about the M1 chip besides its power, it was the energy efficiency that Apple was able to achieve with that low power chip. This meant that Apple could ship a design like the MacBook Air that could be passively cooled without the need for a fan, and inside of that machine, we pretty much got minimal thermal throttling. Heck, this even carried over to the M1 iPad Pro where you had this ultra thin body housing the M1 chip that were just as powerful as the ones found in the MacBook Air. In other designs like the MacBook Pro and Mac Mini, both of which shipped with active cooling systems, or let's be honest, a little fan to help dissipate heat, this boosted the sustained performance even more for those chips and still resulted in machines that were not only energy efficient, but for the most part, dead silent and cool to the touch. The M2 will have those same benefits while getting that power boost thanks to TSMC's N4P process, which we have already seen again with Apple's A15 chip. And again, that results in 11% faster performance, but on the same power, or if Apple really wanted to maximize battery life, they could get 22% less power consumption for the same exact power as the M1 chip. This would give us the same battery life at best with increased performance. And when you're not utilizing the M2 chip to its fullest, it could actually mean even greater battery life savings. And the two M1 laptops we already have, like the M1 MacBook Air and M1 MacBook Pro, are already battery life champs, with the Air receiving 18 hours of battery life and the Pro receiving a whopping 20 hours. And if battery life is one of your greatest concerns, that's actually more battery life than the more expensive 14 inch MacBook Pro, which only comes with a 17 hour rating. Only, I said only. 17 hours is still amazing. Like th these, these chips are so energy efficient, even on the Pro level, but M2 is going to be even more energy efficient than those. And the only laptop that would beat that in estimated battery life is the 16 inch model, but that's due to the size and battery capacity of that laptop and not necessarily the efficiency of the chip. And unlike the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pro, which got thicker and heavier, the M2 sheer efficiency means that it will probably come in more portable laptop designs that could weigh less and get even thinner over time, making them ideal for users who value portability over power. So to sum it all up, what does this mean for you, the viewer watching this video, who is trying to decide whether they should buy an M1 now, or maybe an M1 Pro machine, or wait for one of those fabled M2 Max. Well, it's difficult to put everyone into a box, but the M1 machines are still great and will offer very similar pros and cons to the M2. With that being said, the M2 chips will be more powerful at the same efficiency and could be even faster in specific single core CPU tasks, even over the existing 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pro. So it will be very snappy and fast for non-pro users, which is what Apple is targeting. And hey, like the M1 chip, this will punch way above its weight class and actually make a decent pro or prosumer level laptop as well with more than enough CPU power. All right, enough praise though, because like any technology, there's pros and cons, right? So where will the M2 likely fall short? Well, I think where it will fall short is in things like having maximum sustained multi-core performance for advanced users who can take advantage of multi-core performance in apps like photo editing or video editing apps or 3D modeling or rendering programs or development. But again, the M2 will still be pretty reliable here as well. Uh, the real drag for the M2 will probably be in the GPU department where the M1 Pro and M1 Max especially uh, will just give you so much more power. 
And there's weaknesses probably in the specification of the M2 chip itself, because the M2 is likely to still come with limited memory and storage configuration. So that means probably still a maximum of 16 gigabytes of unified memory and two terabytes of max storage. And I think that's the area where most users will decide uh, whether or not they should go with an M2 machine or an M1 Pro or M1 Max machine, because the Pro can be maxed out at 32 gigabytes of memory and the Max at 64 gigabytes of memory. And if you are hitting the walls of that 16 gigabyte threshold for memory, it can definitely cause you some slowdowns as you wait for the memory swap with the SSD. So it's very likely that one of your biggest deciding factors when going for an M2 or an M1 Pro machine maybe won't even be in the CPU or GPU department, it might actually just come down to how much memory you can put in those machines. And at this point, I think that's probably the best way I can sum it up as for what we know now. But that is the detailed breakdown of what I think the differences will be between the M1, the M1 Pro, the M1 Max, and this future M2 chip. If you found this video informative, leave me a like and subscribe for more because there's gonna be a lot more very soon uh, with new videos if we are actually getting a rumored Apple March 8th event. So thank you as always for watching and I will see you all in the next video. Take care everyone.